Coming up on this episode of the EV Resource Podcast, it's all about hydrogen power and is there a future for it in the cars we drive? Well, hello, friends, and welcome to episode 97 of the EV Resource Podcast. I'm Zach Hurst, and each week I bring you the latest EV news, information, and interviews with industry experts. This episode is a little different. I've been working on the research for this for a while now, and I'm finally ready to bring you the information you've asked for regarding hydrogen vehicles. I'm not going to dive too deep into the technical aspects of this technology, mainly because for this episode, I wanted to keep it simple enough for just about anybody to understand. So, is hydrogen a viable option for the future of passenger vehicles? I've heard that hydrogen is a horrible choice for passenger vehicles, and some of the biggest proponents of battery electric vehicles have been some of the most outspoken critics of hydrogen on the matter. Of course, one that comes to mind is Elon Musk, the CEO of world-leading electric car company Tesla, He has spoken out many times against the use of hydrogen in passenger vehicles, saying that the idea is mind-bogglingly stupid. But is it? There are worse things out there, like horse treadmill-powered electric vehicles. And yes, this is a real patent. It's U.S. patent, U.S. number 2020-03-40456A1. And thanks to Brian Evans for sending that one to me. It's a horse on a treadmill that turns a generator that then supplies electricity to an electric motor that then drives the wheels of the vehicle. And I swear to you, I am not making this up. So there are definitely worse ideas out there, but is there a viable path forward towards hydrogen powered vehicles? And in order to answer this question, I wanted to look at three main parts of the technology, how it's generated, the transportation and distribution infrastructure, And then, of course, usage, how we actually use it in the fuel cell of a hydrogen vehicle. But before we dive into that, let's take a look at the brief history of the use of hydrogen in vehicles. And the history of hydrogen-powered vehicles goes back a lot further than you would imagine. In fact, the very first internal combustion engine was powered by hydrogen in 1807. Swiss inventor Francois-Isaac de Rives, I think that's how you pronounce his name, created a four-wheel vehicle which was powered by hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen gas was stored in a balloon, which you could consider a very primitive form of hydrogen fuel cell. And naturally, this is not a design that caught on. It wasn't until more than a 100 years later that we had the first mainstream fuel cell vehicle. In 1939, British engineer Francis Thomas Bacon created a five-kilowatt fuel cell. This like many other attempts before it, was not adopted. And throughout the 20th century, many projects using hydrogen were built, including many prototypes by major automobile manufacturers. In 1999, the first publicly available hydrogen filling station opened in Europe in Hamburg, Germany. In 2014, so this is really within the last decade, Toyota started producing the hydrogen fuel cell-powered Mirai, and then they were joined in 2016 by the Clarity from Honda, and in 2018, the Hyundai Nexo. However, even with major manufacturer support, the technology has not been widely adopted for use in passenger vehicles, and Honda even abandoned its efforts with the Clarity last year due to slow sales. But the idea of hydrogen-powered automobiles isn't dead. President Biden signed into law the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, commonly known as Bipartisan Infrastructure Framework, and a significant portion of this funding is directed to the Department of Energy to advance clean energy technologies, including $9.5 billion in funding intended to accelerate the development of clean hydrogen technology across various value chains of the hydrogen economy. So clearly, there is something here that is desired by the powers that be, But how does it exactly all work? According to the Alternative Fuels Data Center, there are several ways to produce hydrogen. That being said, to keep things simple, I'm going to focus on the methods that are most commonly used to produce hydrogen that is then used in to fuel vehicles, electrolysis and natural gas reforming. And electrolysis is the process that uses an electrical current 
to split water molecules into their hydrogen and oxygen components. This is simple and fairly easy way to produce hydrogen. In fact, I remember doing this as a science experiment in the sixth grade with a nine volt battery and test tubes. So if the electricity is produced by renewable sources, such as solar and wind, the resulting hydrogen would then be considered renewable as well. And this has a number of emissions benefits. Power to hydrogen projects are taking off using excess renewable energy when available to make hydrogen through electrolysis. Then that is fed back into a fuel cell to put power back into the grid. Typical electrolysis systems are about 70% efficient, where 80% efficiency has been achieved through the polymer electrolyte membrane, or PEM, process. And as far as natural gas reforming, as much as 95% of the hydrogen that's made in the United States is through this process, and it's sometimes called steam membrane reforming. And this is a very advanced process that builds on current natural gas pipelines. And it works because natural gas contains methane. That's where you get the steam methane reforming name. And in steam methane reforming, methane reacts with extremely hot steam, as much as 1,000 degrees Celsius in some cases, under extreme pressures between 3 and 25 bar of pressure, and of course one bar is atmospheric pressure or 14.5 PSI, and in the presence of a catalyst, it produces hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and a relatively small amount of carbon dioxide. Steve reforming is endothermic, that is, heat has to be supplied to the process in order for the reaction to take place. After the initial process, there's a next step, which is called the water-gas shift reaction. The carbon monoxide and steam are reacted using another catalyst to produce carbon dioxide and more hydrogen. In a final process step called pressure swing absorption, carbon dioxide and other impurities are removed from the gas stream, leaving essentially pure hydrogen. Steam reforming can be used to produce hydrogen from other fuels as well, such as ethanol, propane, or even gasoline. When that hydrogen is then used in a fuel cell vehicle, it can reduce the total fuel emissions of a vehicle by as much as 90% when compared to traditional gas-powered automobiles. So that's how it's made. Let's talk about how it's transported or distributed from the production facility to the eventual filling station. Most hydrogen in the United States is produced at or close to where it is used, typically at large industrial sites. The infrastructure that is needed to then distribute hydrogen to a nationwide network of fueling stations required naturally for the widespread adoption of fuel cell electric vehicles still needs to be developed. The initial rollout for vehicles and stations has really focused on three distribution networks, primarily in Southern and Northern California. Currently, hydrogen is distributed through three methods. The first is through pipelines, and this is the least expensive way to deliver large amounts of hydrogen, but the capacity is limited because there's only about 1,600 miles of pipelines for hydrogen delivery currently available in the United States. These pipelines are located near very large petroleum refineries and chemical plants in Illinois, California, and the Gulf Coast. A second way of transporting hydrogen is in compressed hydrogen gas trucks, rail cars, or ships. And what they have is these high-pressure tube trailers, but this is expensive and it's used primarily for distances of 200 miles or less. And then you have liquefied hydrogen tankers. Cryogenic liquefaction is a process that cools hydrogen to a temperature where it becomes a liquid. Although the liquefaction process is expensive, it enables hydrogen to be transported more efficiently over long distances by truck, rail car, or ship. If the liquefied hydrogen is not used at a sufficiently high rate at the point of consumption, however, it boils off or evaporates from its containment vessels, and as a result, hydrogen delivery and consumption rates must be very carefully matched. Creating an infrastructure for hydrogen distribution and delivery to thousands of future individual fueling stations really presents a lot of challenges primarily because hydrogen contains less energy per unit volume than all other fuels, transporting, storing, and delivering it to the point of end use is more expensive on a per-gallon basis versus its gasoline equivalent. Building a new hydrogen pipeline network involves high initial capital costs 
and hydrogen's properties present unique challenges to pipeline materials and compressor design. However, because hydrogen can be produced from a variety of resources, regional or even local hydrogen production can maximize the use of local resources and minimize distribution challenges. There are trade-offs between centralized and distributed production to consider. Producing hydrogen centrally in large plants would reduce production costs, but on the flip side of that, you then boost the costs for distribution. Producing hydrogen at the point of end use at fueling stations, for example, cuts distribution costs, but then you have a very significant increase in production costs because of the cost to construct on-site production capabilities. So these challenges have significantly limited what has been built out in terms of distribution and uh, infrastructure so far. Currently, in all of Canada and the United States, there are a grand total of 53 retail hydrogen fueling stations, 48 of which are located in California. There are no retail hydrogen filling stations showing anywhere else according to the Alternative Fueling Station Locator tool on the Alternative Fuels Data Center website, which I used for a lot of my research. So 53 sites, 48 of which are in California, and that's across Canada and the United States. And just for comparison, there are 718 biodiesel sites, 872 for compressed natural gas, 3,221 propane filling sites, and 53,372 EV charging stations listed. So obviously there are some challenges in that the infrastructure for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles just isn't there. But any new technology requires some time to build out that infrastructure. I mean, there was a time when there was no EV charging stations around the country. So maybe that's something that we'll see built out. However, is it even worth it? The way we use the hydrogen in fuel cell electric vehicles is also very important to consider. First, let me point out that hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are considered electric vehicles. Fuel cells are more efficient than gas-powered cars and emit no harmful tailpipe emissions, only water vapor and warm air. So they are a very good alternative to gas and diesel vehicles. Fuel cells work kind of like batteries in a way. So uh, having a basic knowledge of how batteries work will probably help understand the explanation that I'm about to give. Uh, but like batteries need to be recharged constantly in order to use them, fuel cells do not need to be recharged. Fuel cell vehicles will continue to generate electricity from the fuel cell as long as there is a fuel source. The fuel cell consists of two electrodes, a negative electrode or anode and a positive electrode called a cathode. They are then sandwiched around an electrolyte. And a fuel, such as, of course, in this case, hydrogen, is then fed to the anode and air is fed to the cathode. In a hydrogen fuel cell, a catalyst at the anode separates hydrogen molecules into protons and electrons, which take different paths to the cathode. The electrons then go through an external circuit, creating a flow of electricity. The protons migrate through the electrolyte to the cathode, where they unite with oxygen and the electrons to produce water and heat. According to the Department of Energy, this process in hydrogen fuel cells is between 40 and 60% efficient. So compared to the internal combustion engine, it is much better. And honestly, if we were only comparing to gas-powered cars, fuel cell EVs sound like a great option. So why haven't they caught on? Well, simply put, they're not a great option when compared to battery electric vehicles. BEVs are much, much more efficient, up to 90% or greater in some cases, and they have already, as I mentioned, a much greater infrastructure that's already built out. Battery electric vehicles don't require a trip to a fueling station, so we're, we're shifting the pattern and habits that we typically would see of going to a fueling station when you're low on fuel. And with a battery electric vehicle, the energy can be supplied by the vehicle owner themselves through solar panels on the roof of their house. So for passenger vehicles, hydrogen fuel cells just at this point don't make any sense. If there were no such thing as battery electric vehicles, then I'd say absolutely fuel cells should be the way forward. But we have better options now. So 
is there a future for any hydrogen powered vehicles? Well, yes, I think so. For larger vehicles like boats, trains, and airplanes, hydrogen power makes a lot of sense. Those vehicles already travel between set depots where hydrogen filling stations could be installed. And especially with airplanes, it makes a lot of sense because hydrogen weighs a lot less than conventional batteries. With most major automobile manufacturers moving towards battery electric vehicles, it only makes sense that the conversation about hydrogen vehicles shift to more appropriate applications. Sure, there are still challenges to overcome, but if the alternative is to continue to burn gas and diesel and jet fuel, well then I think we don't really have much of a choice. Hydrogen has a future and we should put more resources into figuring out how to make it work. So that's a brief overview for you. If you guys do want more information about hydrogen fuel cells and how this all works, I definitely suggest going over to the Alternative Fuels Data Center. There's a lot of great information there. Um, I primarily pulled all of this from that uh, collection of websites and where they sent me to. Um, so what do you think? Do, is the, am I on the right path here? Do we have a path forward for hydrogen fuel cells in larger vehicles? And is it an absolutely ridiculous thought of putting it in passenger vehicles? Or do I have it wrong? Let me know what you think by putting a comment or sending an email to hello at ev-resource.com. So that's it for this episode. I do hope that you got some information out of it, maybe something that you didn't know before. I am also putting together a traditional episode this week for with the latest EV news, so make sure you look out for that. If you aren't subscribed already, you'll want to do that. That way you get that show downloaded automatically on your favorite podcast player. Or if you watch the YouTube videos, you'll get notified when I upload that video. So thank you so much for watching and listening, and I'll catch you all next time.